How's that, uh, how's that TikTok life, Mike? What's up, man? Let's not talk about that. Hey peeps, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm chatting about contingency arguments, idealism, the argument from limits, and much more with Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. Many thanks to Marlon Wilson from the Gospel Truth YouTube channel for allowing me to repost this video. It was a pretty fun and edifying discussion, and I think you guys will get something out of it. All right, without further ado, let's dig in. Thank you guys once again for joining me, man. So we're going to start this off. We're just going to, I would like you guys to sort of give your, your positions on the contingency argument uh, and just sort of lay out the groundwork for it a little bit for the audience. And also uh, then after that, we're going to uh, sort of let you guys dialogue about some of the things you may get disagree with concerning the contingency argument. All right. And then we're going to follow that with a little bit of Q&A uh, from the audience. And, uh, and that's about it, man. So I don't think we decide who wants to go first. I think Mike. Uh, Mike, do you mind going first, or how you want to do that? Yeah, I, w I was hoping I could present uh, just a basic contingency argument for the audience. Uh, two arguments, I guess, for the, the second stage of the contingency argument, and then let Joe uh, offer criticisms, tear it apart, because I'm very interested to hear what he has to say and uh, <laughs> offer some criticisms on there. Uh, okay. So if you guys are okay, I can proceed. You got it. All right, so yeah, so the contingency argument is uh, basically an argument that argues for God's existence from contingency. Well, what is contingent? Well, uh, anything that could fail to exist. Uh, uh, you know, I am contingent, Joe is con contingent, you're contingent, anything. The opposite of contingency is necessity, something that cannot fail to exist. So philosophers that use the contingency argument say, well, why are there contingent things? Uh, it must uh, go back to a necessary uh, uh, substance. So the first stage of the contingency argument is arguing that contingent things uh, would basically have an explanation of some sort that is a necessary foundation. Um, as far as I, I think, I think Joe and I are okay on that. I don't think we disagree. Well, we're going to disagree with like a stage two uh, version. I would argue that it goes back to a necessary being that we call God. Uh, and so what do I mean by necessary being? I tend to define it as, as, a, as a being, this Im an immaterial mind that created the universe that we inhabit and it would have absolute perfection. So I'll start defining some of these things. So that's generally contingency argument. So step one, uh, contingent things exist basically and they have an explanation uh, in some sort of necessary substance. Step two, that necessary substance, it would be a necessary mind Conclusion, therefore God exists, that is this necessary mind. So let me just, I'll present two ways I sort of argue for that. Uh, just, just give some groundwork because I don't want to go too in depth and I'm not going to try to go too deep into my, the science I use for this, uh, for the sake of clarity. But let's talk a little bit about uh, why we, I would appeal to a, um, a necessary being. Well, building off scholars like um, Josh Rasmussen or uh, Richard Swinburne, um, I would argue that a necessary being is the most likely explanation. Why? Well, because uh, we want to sort of reduce the number of brute facts when it comes to explanations. And if we just appeal uh, to just something that is not absolutely perfect, uh, we start to create arbitrary limits and we want to, want to reduce the number of limits and brute facts as much as possible. So if I were to appeal to sort of like a quasi perfect being, not a, not a perfect being, but like a quasi great being, we would have to ask a question about, okay, well, why does this uh, foundation for the universe have a arbitrary limit? Why is it not all powerful? Uh, what sets this sort of arbitrary limit? So Josh Rasmussen says uh, basically like, well, we sort of add additional complexity there to explain this additional limit it has. And instead it's just simpler because simplicity is a very important part of this argument. We want a simple explanation, not just a coherent one, one that explains all of the data, but something that is simple. And if you start setting sort of like a quasi great being or a quasi great substance, we need to ask questions about why it has certain limits. And a simpler explanation to why there are contingent things would have no limits uh, because it would just simply be perfect. So I would argue that uh, it is a perfect being. Now, uh, by absolute perfection, let me sort of define that. I mean, the, it's the, I mean, the core property of perfection entails all great making properties. So uh, this being would have um, all great making properties. Um, it would be conscious because uh, I would argue, and maybe we could talk about it later. It's better. It's actually more valuable to be a conscious being than a non-conscious uh, substance. But it would also have omnipotence, uh, unlimited power without limitations there. Because uh, again, setting uh, arbitrary limits on this being's power 
uh, would need to be explained and have additional uh, um, explanation to explain why those limits are there. So it's a simple explanation to a tailwind with unlimited power, uh, as well as omniscience. So unlimited, so uh, knowledge of all things, as well as necessity. Uh, so uh, one argument I know that Rasmussen, I, I believe he brings up, is uh, the difference between uh, positing a necessary being as the foundation of reality versus a necessary substance. Uh, he points out that if a being entails absolute perfection, it reduces the number of brute facts, namely that this is the only brute fact would be that this being has absolute perfection. If it's just a necessary substance that doesn't have absolute perfection in the form of a being, then there's no reason as to why it's necessary. It's just another uh, a brute fact added on top of there. So it would make more sense to posit something that has absolute perfection because all you have to do is posit absolute perfection. And once you posit that, it explains all of the properties this being would have. Uh, it would also explain many things we see in the universe because when we're talking about the contingency argument, we're talking about everything that sort of came into existence. So theism positing a being has more explanatory value via its own ontology. Like we experience uh, morality in this universe. Well, why? Well, because that would flow from this being's goodness. Uh, we uh, have consciousness. We're conscious beings. Well, why? Well, because we came from a necessary conscious being. Instead of pausing some necessary substance that isn't conscious and then somehow creates consciousness, overcoming the hard problem, again, it's another uh, thing that would need to be explained. Uh, God can explain the laws of nature as well because he has the power to create them and he has the desire to sustain them for conscious creatures to emerge. So the ontology of a perfect being can explain more things about why the contingent universe is the way it is. Uh, so that would be the, sort of the first approach to do. There, there's more I could say on there, but I don't want to go too much into there. But generally, it's the idea that if we're talking namely about the philosophical implications of the contingent universe and why there are contingent things, we need to eventually go back to a necessary foundation. And we want to make a simple argument. And the simplest argument is going to be just positing the least number of brute facts, namely there is an absolute perfect being, and that explains why he has the properties he does, it explains why he creates the universe the way it is, and sort of just has more explanatory power in my view. So there's one way I can look at it. Another way I want to look at it is from an idealist approach. Uh, and if, if people have watched some of Joe's previous stuff, I'll be building off a little bit of the conversation he had on invoking theism, so reference for Joe there, because I'm also a theistic idealist, and by what that means is I believe that all reality is essentially mind. I don't believe in two substances, mind and matter. I would say all is mind. And matter, it just reduces to essentially information, which is contingent upon mind. So basically, let me give an example, explain this. So take a look at my phone here. So I could explain it as hard, um, front is shiny, it lights up. Um, you know, I could explain it in terms of colors, qualia, these types of things. And using David Hume's bundle theory, as modern idealists do, we'd argue physical objects reduced basically to properties. Uh, I can explain it all of it in terms of its properties, um, ment but these are mental properties. I'm explaining it in terms of qualia, uh, how it appears and whatnot, without any reference to a physical actual substance. So the idealist approach simply says that all of physical reality reduces to information. I'm not gonna get into the physics because uh, Joe said he's not, has not really studied that, but I, I will just simply say that it, that does seem to be where the physics is going as well. So philosophers like Minor uh, Coleman have argued that physics and quantum field theory basically is reducing to information. And he is positing something called ontic structural realism, which essentially means we're describing physical reality, not in terms of substance or particles down there, but just in terms of information. So physical reality seems to reduce to information on that. That's all I'll say on there. So my essential, my view is like, if an idealist approach is more likely, all of physical reality reduces to information, which is contingent upon mind, uh, then we need to ask simple questions. So it seems as though is that uh, consciousness does not come from matter. Matter seems to be information contingent upon conscious minds. And if that's the case, we need to ask the simple question is like, well, where do I, our minds come from? Because we're contingent. So it would be more far more likely that if consciousness is more fundamental than matter, our conscious experience is what I mean, uh, then there probably our own contingency would depend on a larger mind, so to speak. I'm just using larger in a colloquial sense there, but some sort of necessary contingent, necessary conscious mind, excuse me, uh, from which all of reality emerges from. Uh, so here's generally what I'm trying to say here. So if you're going to take a physicalist or a materialistic approach, uh, you can't really posit like this underlying 
particles anymore because of quantum field theory. Everything seems to reduce to information. So you got to posit an undetectable material, some sort of substance down there that gives rise to quantum field theory, that then gives rise to particles, that then gives rise to people, life, and conscious experience. Uh, there's a lot of um, things you got to explain in that field. Whereas on an idealistic approach, you start with what we know exists. We know we're conscious. We know consciousness exists. And we can explain it in terms of its own ontology, not appealing to a physical ontology. So we start with consciousness. It's fundamental. Gives rise to the physical world. And then if all of reality is mind, well, it entails that there's some sort of, and there is a necessary foundation, uh, it entails that that underlying foundation would also be a mind or conscious in some sort. And that is what we would call God. So generally, those are the two ways I would try to argue from it. There are other ways I could. I don't want to overload the audience. I want to try to keep this as simple as possible. But I really hope Joe can tear this apart. And I mean that because I really want to think about this. I hope he can give me some good objections to think about, to take away from this, things I can reflect on. So I will turn it over to him. We can have a conversation, whatever, if he wants to, you know, expose me because I he's written far more on this than me. I really want to hear it, I hope, because I really want to take away from this things to think about. So back to you. All right, Joe, uh, you want to take some time to sort of explain your position on it, and uh, we can go to discussion after that. Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you, Michael, for that. Um, I appreciate it. I'm also here to learn. I'm not here to defend a tribe or anything like that. I consistently find myself flaunting the views of every tribe that there is. Uh, I kind of like hanging around in that zone. Um, but yeah, so I guess I'll first touch on my view of contingency arguments more generally, and then I will look at Michael's more specific case which I think is really interesting and, and not ludicrous. Uh, I, think it's, I think it deserves uh, a tremendous amount of reflection and uh, critical scrutiny, and I, I, think it's, I think it's innovative. Okay, so my view on contingency arguments more generally is that it depends on the contingency argument. Contingency arguments are a family of arguments. It's like ontological arguments, or it's like teleological arguments. It's really a family of different arguments. You have modal contingency arguments, you have non-modal contingency arguments, you have ones that focus on causation, ones that focus on explanation, ones that rule out infinite regresses of certain sorts, ones that don't. So it all just kind of depends on which contingency argument we're talking about. That said, if we're just talking about a kind of plain vanilla contingency argument, like there are contingent things, if there are contingent things, then there's probably an explanation of them, and if there's probably an explanation of them, then there's probably something like a necessary concrete being, necessary concrete foundation of reality. Let's say I'm sympathetic with that. So I'm sympathetic with that broad brushstrokes, plain vanilla style, stage one of contingency arguments, that there is some one or more necessary concrete foundational realities. Stage two then, as Michael rightly pointed out, then tries to infer that this concrete necessary foundation is God, or at least has certain godlike features. And that's where I tend to jump ship. Uh, I've, in my personal experience, I've found that stage two arguments usually are a lot less convincing, a lot less plausible than stage one, at least by my lights. And uh, for me, I'm agnostic on what the necessary foundation might be. I think there are boatloads of different proposals. There are certain theistic proposals, uh, you know, different models of God there. Uh, but there are non-theistic proposals, and those can be, you know, categorized into naturalistic and non-naturalistic. So on the naturalistic side, it could be one or more quantum fields. It could be a universal wave function, which could be construed in either spatiotemporal and non-spatiotemporal terms. It might be a collection of myriological symbols or physical symbols. It might be uh, relations a la ontic structural realism. It might be dynamic physical principles. David Gunn has a paper that he published in the Philosopher's Imprint, uh, wherein he talks about this. It's called On the Ultimate Origination of Things. Uh, it could be the universe as a whole, a la Jonathan Schaffer's priority monism. It could be Graham Oppie's initial singularity. It could be matter or energy. Um, those are just the naturalistic non-theistic proposals, uh, but they're also non-naturalistic non-theistic foundations that might be the foundation of reality. You could have a kind of Neoplatonic one, this absolutely simple impersonal being that, uh, f that emanates all of the rest of the complex realm that we, uh, that we see around us. Uh, it could be a kind of atheistic Thomism, as I call it. Not Thomism in the sense of, you know, there's this absolutely simple divine being, but no, it is an absolutely simple being, but it's just not divine. It's just this impersonal being, which is subsistent existence itself. It's a purely actual being. Its essence is numerically identical with its existence, um, from which flows everything else, all the things in which essence and existence are distinct. Um, you could kind of give an atheistic Thomistic view. You could have an atheistic Aristotelian purely actual unmoving 
removed mover. You could have the Tao. You could have Brahman. I mean, there are so many Brahman impersonally construed, of course. There are different strands of Hinduism. Okay, so that is all just to say that... Um, by my lights, there are lots of different candidates for what the necessary foundation might be. Uh, and lots of them are going to predict different things, depending on whether or not you have a non-theistic, non-naturalistic one, depending on whether you have a naturalistic one. Um, their simplicity is going to diverge. Their explanatory power is going to diverge. And all that just makes me extremely hesitant to, um, you know, confidently pronounce on stage two, uh, given that there are so many hosts of different hypotheses here, which... Um, vastly diverge from one another, and also diverge in terms of their simplicity, intrinsic probability, their, the way that they predict the data, etc. Okay, and so that's part of the reason why I'm agnostic. Okay, so that's my general view on contingency arguments, and now I'd like to turn to uh, Michael's case in particular. So on the argument from limits, uh, I'm just going to make a few points or a few reservations. I've talked with Josh about this back and forth for probably hundreds if not thousands, and I'm, I kid you not when I say that, hundreds if not thousands of emails, so um, <laughs> over uh, the last maybe five years. So yeah, a uh, lot of thoughts on this one, and I actually have a video coming out tomorrow on the argument from limits, so um, yeah, looking forward to that. Okay, so firstly you said that um, the view on which the foundation is unlimited is simpler. Now it might be simpler in the sense of it doesn't take as many words to say, like, oh, it's unlimited. You know, it's just it's kind of syntactically simple to be able to state it. But it's not clear to me that it's a simple hypothesis when we're not just taking into account, like, the words that used to say it, but, like, the actual conceptual content contained therein. Because what you're really saying is that um, it's, like, it's not just unlimited, but it's unlimited in all these different respects, right? Axiologically unlimited, unlimited in goodness, unlimited in power, and so on. And in order, from those, in order to, get, to get those entailments just from the fact that it's unlimited, you have to add a bunch of auxiliary hypotheses. You don't just get from this bare being unlimited or not being restricted that, for instance, it's omnibenevolent or that it's omniscient or that it is omnipotent. You have to add auxiliary hypotheses. Richard Swinburne, for instance, adds, adds auxiliary hypotheses like reason's internalism and all these, you know, this huge elaborate edifice of hypotheses. So it's not clear to me that it's actually simpler. It might be simple to just say, oh, it's unlimited. But when you actually try to flesh out the hypothesis and try to get non-trivial entailments from that, you have to add a bunch of auxiliaries, and that's going to lower its probability. Speaking also in terms of probability, it seems to me that it's going to be far more intrinsically likely that the foundation is going to be limited in some respect along some axis or other than it is going to be unlimited in every respect whatsoever. Because for any respect that we're focusing on, right, there's really only one way, one or two ways to be unlimited with respect to that respect, with respect to that aspect, that property. You could have it to an unlimited, like, infinite degree, or you could have it to a kind of qualitatively complete degree. I guess it's not really a degree, but you could have it in a kind of qualitatively complete manner. So there are only one or two ways to be unlimited with respect to a property. But there are like infinitely many ways to be limited with respect to that same property. You can have it to this degree, or a slightly higher degree, or a slightly higher degree, or a slightly lower degree, or a slightly lower degree, and so on. So there are so many more ways for the foundation to be limited, even along a single axis, with respect to any of its given properties. And then when you factor in all of its different properties, the boatloads of different properties that, we, that uh, is being ascribed to this being, I think it's far more intrinsically likely, given that there are so many more ways for it to be limited in some way or another, I think it's far more intrinsically likely that the, that the foundation is limited in some manner. So that's kind of one mode of criticism, or I guess two modes of criticism. One was that I'm not, it's actually not clear to me that it's all that simple. And then another one is that uh, it seems far more intrinsically likely that the foundation would be limited in some respect or other. Um, I also wonder about whether or not this minimizes brute facts, uh, at least with respect to certain other hypotheses. Like, it's not clear to me. Because again, in order to infer, like, you want to go from unlimited to perfect, and from perfect, you know, a perfect being essentially has every perfection and essentially lacks every imperfection. But in order to get non-trivial entailments from that, right, you have to add in claims about what are perfections, what are the perfections. You're going to say uh, being minded is a perfection, being knowledgeable and infinitely knowledgeable is a perfection, being powerful uh, is a perfection, being good is a perfection, and so on. So you're adding in these things. And it's not clear to me that those have explanations, right? They might be intuitive. That might be a reason for thinking that they are true, right? It is intuitive that goodness is a perfection or that knowledge is a perfection. But that's separate from what explains why goodness is a perfection or why knowledge is a perfection. And to me, those seem just like kind of primitive. Uh, I, don't, I don't really see what more fundamental explanations we could point to to explain those. And if that's the case, well, then in order to fill out your hypothesis, in order to get these non-trivial entailments that really do bring you to God, you're going to have to bring in lots of different brute facts about which properties are indeed the perfections and which properties are the imperfections. It's actually not clear to me that you are minimizing brute facts. 
at the very least, it's not clear to me that compared to all these competitor hypotheses, you're going to have fewer brute facts. Uh, the next thing that I want to say is that not having limits does not entail being perfect. So being unlimited does not entail being perfect. Because there are actually three ways, I think, to be unlimited with respect to a certain property. I, I gave two earlier. You could have the property and have it to an infinite degree. You could have the property and have it to a qualitatively complete manner. Or you could just lack the property altogether, right? Because then you're not limited with respect to that property. It's not like you have some finite degree and you're asking, oh, why is it that finite degree rather than that plus one or that minus one? Like, why is it good to this extent rather than a little bit more or a little bit less? Another way to be unlimited with respect to goodness is to simply be the kind of thing to which predicates like goodness and value do not even apply in the first place. So a manner in which the foundation could be unlimited, maybe it, it, it has no axiological properties whatsoever. It, it doesn't have any goodness. It doesn't have any of these things that contribute to greatness. And it's just unlimited in the various respects that it does have. So maybe it's, maybe it's like a timeless, non-spatial-temporal universal wave function or something like that. And it just it doesn't even have value properties. And so it's not as though it has some limited degree of value. No, it's a thoroughly unlimited thing. It's just it doesn't even have these relevant properties um, that could allow you to infer that it's like uh, infinitely good or things like that. So I don't think being unlimited entails being perfect, which is crucially needed for this argument to succeed. You need to be able to go from being unlimited to being perfect. And I just don't think that works. Another point that I want to make, and this is the last point that I'll make on the argument from limits, and then I'll briefly turn to the idealism point, is that uh, it seems to me that God's going to be limited in lots of different ways. Um, and so if we have an unlimited foundation, it seems to me that that's not going to be able to be God. So, of course, you know, for, for Christians in particular, this is an ad hominem in the sense of, in the strict technical tense, ugh, strict <laughs> strict technical tense, that was terrible, in the strict technical sense of ad hominem, where you are going after um, a kind of internal tension within your opponent's views, not, you're not insulting them and inferring that their, uh, their argument is fallacious or mistaken. Instead, you are pointing out an internal tension in their views. So I think Trinitarians in particular, right, God is limited in his number of persons in which he exists. It's three, not four, not two, not infinitely many. That, that would be the kind of unlimited way you could uh, exist in divine persons. But no, it's limited to three. Now, the way that Josh Rasmussen gets around this, gets around this problem, is to say that, okay, well, the foundation can't have any fundamental limits. It can be limited in non-fundamental respects. But then once you say that, there, there are at least two problems with that. Firstly, then that's implying that the divine persons aren't fundamental, which, whoa, that does not seem, that does not seem to be within the realms of orthodoxy. Whatever is God is supposed to be fundamental to reality. But these divine persons, per this view, are non-fundamental, so they're not God, it seems to me. But more fundamentally, pardon the pun, a second problem is that the naturalist can then make the exact same move, right? The naturalist can then say, oh, okay, once you allow that move, my foundation is, uh, is limited in a whole host of respects. It's limited in power. It's limited in its spatial extent. It's limited in its temporal extent. It's limited in all these things. But it's got a fundamental layer which is unlimited and which explains all these various limits that it has. And maybe that fundamental layer is just a kind of qualitatively simple trope or something like that. Uh, a trope is a particular property, and we can suppose that it's a non-quantitative property. Maybe it's some, some sort of primitive essence, or maybe it's some sort of hexiety, or whatever. But that my point is that once you make this move, in order to get around the Trinitarian problem, to say that um, there, uh, there are non-fundamental limits in this thing, and it's simply fundamentally unlimited, well, then the naturalist can say that they, they, po they can posit a whole host of uh, fundamental limits in their being, or non-fundamental limits in their foundation, and then say that those are just explained in terms of more fundamental, unlimited, uh, purely qualitative features, one or more features. So those are two problems, I think, um, for that response to the Trinitarian worry. And I also think God has to, has to be limited in various other respects, like um, like his desires, for instance, have to track how the strength of his desires for actualizing certain worlds. It has to be stronger for some worlds as opposed to others. Because some worlds are objectively better than other worlds. Some worlds contain much more goodness than others. Uh, so then, because God is perfectly rational, the strength of his reasons and desires is going to have to be tracking the strength of the relative goodness of the worlds, and hence the strength of his desires are going to have to be at least different. Uh, one of them, some of them are going to be stronger than others, in which case they're not going to be all maxed out. They're not going to be maximal. They're not going to be unlimited, the strength of these reasons or desires. And so God is, it seems to me that God is going to have to be limited in various ways, in which case he can't be the unlimited foundation of reality. Okay, uh, that's what I want to say about the argument from limits. And then on to idealism briefly. Um, so, I'm actually, I, I mean, I, I don't have too much to say on idealism. I'm not as resistant as many people might imagine 
uh, me to be or imagine a non-theist to be. I think uh, idealism is actually uh, quite a respectable view about reality. Uh, one worry that I've had, and I don't know how serious this is, uh, Michael's probably going to demolish this, I don't know how serious this is, but like, it seems to be the case that we're all intuitively, kind of common sensely resistant to idealism. Uh, you know, you had, what was it, Jonathan Edwards, who, upon hearing about idealism, says, I refute it thusly, and then he kicks up the little, uh, the rock. Now, of course, that's not totally fair to idealists, but I think it's showing that it's kind of like common sense. It's kind of intuitive that I, we're not intuitive idealists. We are intuitive, shall we say, external world physical object realists. Now, of course, I know you believe in physical objects and believe in an external world, but I mean, like, how common sense conceives of them as non-mental. So... If that's the case, if we are indeed, as it seems to me in all my undergrad philosophy classes and talking with everyone that I have about idealism, uh, who isn't antecedently an idealist, it seems as though we're all kind of intuitively resistant to idealism, and we have this kind of intuitive, commonsensical view on which idealism is false. But if that's the case, well then, I don't know, that seems to be very surprising that, that God would create us with these plausibility structures, these intuitive, commonsensical structures, which are like radically misguided about the fundamental nature of reality and about God's nature, like... Um, that just seems really implausible. Like, uh, imagine, imagine if God created us so that we were, like, really resistant to being theists. Like, that would be really surprising on theism. Now, of course, this isn't as radical as that, but it's kind of close. I mean, this is something about the fundamental nature of God himself, how he relates to creation, and uh, how creation is fundamentally. Like, yeah, anyway, it just seems surprising that, that God would... I mean, I'm not saying it's decept deceptive, but it just it seems surprising that he would create us so that we are so intuitively resistant uh, to the way that reality really is and to the way that God himself is. So that, that's one worry that I have. Uh, and again, I don't know how serious that is. That, that, this could be totally blown out of the water. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I guess one more thing is that I do worry about the bundle theory underlying this. Um, uh, I mean, I, if bundle theory is true, I wonder if I've persisted throughout this conversation because my various properties have changed. Um, I ha I'm, I'm a little bit older now. I am... Uh, there's a little bit less saliva in my mouth. Uh, <laughs> so I've changed various properties. And so the bundles are different, right? They're not, the same, they're not numerically the same bundle. And if that's the case, well then, and if substances just are, if things just are bundles of properties, then it seems as though I, as a substantial whole, as a thing, have not persisted through this conversation. That seems to me absurd. Uh, surely you're still talking or you're still listening to the same Joe that was there at the beginning uh, when I started this. Um, I also worry about indiscernible objects. So, I mean, I don't really have any proof of this, but it seems to me to be possible that there could be indiscernible objects, that is, objects that share all the same, like, qualities or all the same features or properties as one another. Um, maybe, like, God just creates, like, two angels and they're, like, qualitative duplicates. They're not numerically identical, but they're, like, qualitatively identical. They share all the same qualities. That seems to me to be conceivable. It seems to me to be possible. I don't see any evident absurdity in it. It's, uh, yeah, I don't really see any contradiction there. So I don't really have proof of its possibility, but it does strike me as possible. And if that's true, it seems to me to be the case that uh, bundle theory would be false because they have the same bundles of properties, right? Uh, but yet, because they're indiscernible, and yet they're still distinct things. Now, again, you might say, well, that's question begging. On my view, it follows that that's not possible. Okay, fine, but you're still going against my strong seeming there and my conceivability and etc. cetera. Um, okay. Uh, that's, I guess that's what I'll say. Uh, there's a lot more to say, as you guys can imagine. I have much more to say about um, idealism and the nature of mind and uh, the relationship between the mind and the body and so on. But I think that suffices for present purposes, uh, and I hope that that is sufficiently edifying for the audience. Uh, and I look forward to our conversation because, yeah, we're not here to knock anybody down, but to learn from one another, at least not. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, both of you, for just laying out your thoughts on the... Uh the set the subject matter and so i'm gonna allow you guys to go ahead and tackle the issues you know i'm sure mike has some thoughts now since he heard you and obviously joe you have some more uh contentions of what joe's position uh, mike's positions uh show so i'm gonna allow you guys to discuss it and i'll be jumping in and out man i may have some questions as you guys are discussing these matters all right so uh well, you guys unfortunately got i don't Unfortunately, I don't know who anybody is anymore because you all have changed properties since this beginning of this conversation. So. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <man. laughs> so, if, if if I may, could we start with the idealism stuff because I do want to I do want to clarify absolutely. some things really quickly. So, like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and yeah, in the book Idealism in New, New Essays in Metaphysics, they, they they bring up bundle theory, but it, it's not so much like it's just for physical objects. It's not so much for like conscious agents. So, like. 
yeah, my body is a collection of properties, but there's still a conscious agent in there. So there's still continual unity in that sense, in the mental sense. It's only for physical objects is what they sort of use bundle theory for. Now, David Hume, of course, used it for, you know, beyond for agents as well. But I, I wouldn't, and the, the, the philosophers in that book don't either. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. Um, yeah. I, go ahead, yeah. I was just going to briefly say, I do worry then that it's like a really disunified view of reality. I don't know. I, I kind of want a unifying account of what things are. And if, if I have to divorce that from what conscious things are from like these non-conscious things in my environment, it seems a little bit, I don't know, it just seems a little bit profligate, metaphysically profligate. Like I would want a unifying account of what things are. Um, but, you know, maybe that's just a price to like a bullet yeah, to I'm bite. Not, I don't not, know. I guess I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, like, what do you mean like unifying? Because like, I would say like, so, you know, if it's, yeah. you know, unification there. It's just uh, that's how you can see how, you know, physical objects could break down into properties as well. Like, you know, like, and to give an analogy, like in a video game, you can see a tree there, uh, but it's obviously going to break down into ones and zeros or the properties that sort of are emergent there. Yeah. So what I was thinking is like when we're giving these sorts of general metaphysical accounts of like what substances are or what objects are, um, at least for me, I would want to give a kind of an account that doesn't say like for for like living things, they, they are just this. Whereas for everything else, every other substance, they fall under this other uniform account because we're, we're, we seem to be multiplying different fundamental kinds that there are in our ontology. If we can kind of give a unifying, uh, like a single account that, that can account for or accurately describe objects of every kind, uh, then we don't have to have this like fundamentally bifurcated view of reality. Uh, as dividing into these kinds of substances that obey these sorts of rules, and then these other ones, which uh, they are kind of the bundle theory ones, and then the other ones aren't the bundle theory ones. It's kind of a minor worry, and it's about simplicity, so um, we can move on. If I mean, you can have the next final word on that if you want. No, I, I understand your worry. I think that's a good point. I mean, I again, I, as, as an idealist, I do think there is some unification there. It's just that the material just seems to be more... I guess I, inform, I keep using the word information because it just it seems like the best way to explain it. Uh, it's just you know it, it's it, it's not so much that there's different substances that are under bundle theory because it's all mind on my view. It's not yeah, different yeah. substances, but yeah, let yeah I, I get your total point. That, oh. That's a fair worry. Sorry, one oh, thing just came to mind. <laughs> I know, no, one thing just came to mind um, on that point. So and then we can move on. Um, after you get the final word, because I said that you get it. Okay, uh, one thing just came to mind on that, and it's that, um, like, even if I take your response there and, and we ignore that kind of bifurcated view of reality worry, um, like, it still seems intuitive that, like, th like, listen, this this water bottle was here and it got older as well. Like, it gained gained some properties while that, and like, intuitively, at least this seems to be the common sense view that, like, that's the same water bottle that was there at the end of this my talk as it was there at the beginning. But under bundle theory, it seems as though we can't actually say that. Um, so, like, it's it, I still think that there's this intuitive worry for bundle theory. I gave my example and you rightly attacked it because I gave it in terms of me, right? And so. That was a good attack, but I think the worry could just be shifted to like physical objects, and I think it's still there. Yeah, I think I think my my response would be is like it, to me that's not that's not a worry. I guess it's because it's it's not if there's no reference to it. If I can't find any evidence of, of a, a substance, you know, on my idealist view beyond there, to me it's just like like it's like if I, I use the analogy of video games all the time because it's like I don't have to worry about like if the cup is actually a real thing in the game that I'm playing in because. That's not the point of it. It's there for, you know, interaction to help me play along the game or move it maybe from one table to another. Uh, if I'm, you know, doing some sort of puzzle solving thing, it's, I don't have to, to me, that's not a big deal, I guess. So I guess we just sort mm -hmm. of, for one, it's a worry for me. It's like, well, they're physical things. Physical things are not fundamental. So, you know, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One person's modus ponens is another's modus tollens. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> I do want to. I do. I'm really glad you brought up the culturally, the, the intuitive stuff, the idea that we feel intuitively resistant to it, because that was my first thought when I before I became an idealist. Um, this just doesn't seem intuitively. There, there are two things I want to say on that. Uh, for one, let me start culturally speaking. I don't. I, I feel like that's a cultural, uh, a cultural belief we have that it's intuitive that idealism is just wrong because if you go to like east the eastern religions it, it's the exact opposite like in india for example or southeast asia and if you go back to the ancient near east for example they had a lot of intuition about the nature of physical reality that we don't share 
uh, like um, understanding of time, for example, was radically different uh, compared to ours. Uh, their understanding of um, of the, their ho their own selves. I mean, uh, there there is debate about this. I, I will acknowledge that, but they seem to be more modest, or you know, modest in terms of how they thought of themselves, not so much substance dualists in the ancient Near East. Uh, now, they, I still think they did believe in some form of spirit, but they tend to identify it with um, you know, air or breath in that kind of sense. So yeah, I, I think in the West, we definitely have this intuitive resistance to idealism because that, that's because I think we're very much sort of basking in, in our history of materialism or substance dualism. And that seems to be the resistance here because if you go to like India or Far East, they're like, oh, yeah, this is what we believe for centuries. Like, it's not a, not a big deal. Like what you call idealism is just, you know, the way we look at reality and have, you know, for, you know, centuries upon centuries. So I wonder if that's more of a I mean, I think it's an important point to bring up. and I'm glad you did, because it is something I do see with people. I think maybe it's more of just a cultural thing, not so much an actual like base intuition, I guess. I can I can definitely see that now. Part of this is what does indeed uh, rest on like socio historical cultural facts that of which I am unaware. So that that's part of the you know like I in order to arbitrate on this sort of debate, I would want to kind of like research those questions further. So I'll just kind of bracket that point and grant that there are indeed like certain cultures that are far less intuitively resistant to a kind of idealist metaphysics. Um, that's just an area. That's just a gap in my knowledge. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, what to make of that? So, I mean, do you still, do you think, and again, this is just a question, like, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to this, but do you think it's still kind of surprising on theism that God would indeed allow, like, huge swaths of important cultures to be, like, fundamentally misguided in their intuitions about God himself and the nature of reality, presumably through no fault of their own? That just seems a little bit surprising on theism, um, that, like, we he'd allow us to be so commonsensically and intuitively resistant to the fundamental nature of him and his relation to the world and the nature of the world. Um, do you see any worry about that? I mean, I don't see that as a worry in terms of the contingency argument. I would see it more as like maybe connected to like divine hiddenness argument or maybe an argument maybe from the problem of evil like related to that. And there'd be ways I would address that namely through like freedom, uh, the, you know, the ability to grow as a mature self. Uh, and experience reality in you know in certain ways so that God can create unique stories. So the, I mean I feel like that would be more of a worry in that area, uh, not not really when it comes to this. I guess you could say if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean I could see that. What I'm just trying to do is just tease out the predictive power of your view and see if mm -hmm. it has certain you know explanatory deficiencies. So regardless of where it falls. Um, you know, categorically speaking. I mean, um, I guess a, a way a way I could say it is like I mean like I. I'll just say I, I am definitely open and think it's possible there is life on like numerous planets across the universe. Um, of course, I can't prove that. Of course, I have no evidence for it. I just think I just tend to lean that way. And I guess it comes from my understanding of uh, how I believe life and evolution arises. So I'm more for the audience sake. I'm a structuralist. I think life is inevitable and it's inevitable in the laws of nature. So life is going to appear on multiple planets. That's generally how I argue for that. So I think like. Just, I say all that to bring this back around. Uh, basically, if if God is going to create a universe, and is he going, how much, to, to, you know, like control is he going to put on every single planet out there to sort of control to make sure people have, like, the right beliefs about these little things that may or may not affect, you know, salvation in terms of, like, a, a Christian understanding? Because, you know, I'm talking about my worldview here. Because that's not essential to salvation or getting to know him. Because, you know, I don't think you don't have to be idealist to be saved or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. So I just think, you know, it's not that important for the whole, you know, thing. I think it would, it just would maybe introduce too much control on God's part. Yeah, that's fine. And I think, we, you know, we probably could explore that for another day. I mean, that's probably a whole separate topic on its own, <laughs> like, because it gets into, as you well, pointed I mean, out, like, and I wish I could talk to you for, like, three hours, but unfortunately, you know, <laughs> we both have lives. Um, yes, exactly. But unfortunately, we have lives. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, I guess here's my here's a question I have for you. Um, if you could be convinced idealism was true, and I know you're not, but if you could, do you think that would lead to just uh, the the necessary foundation being theistic or personal in some way, or do you still see like a way that it could not be? Yeah, so I think that would be really good evidence for it being a theistic foundation, but I definitely think that there are ways uh, in the epistemic space for it not to be theistic. So, like, there could be these sort of 
you know, we could make these sort of subtle distinctions between conscious properties and then a conscious mind which harbors those conscious properties. So maybe there's like some sort of um, fundamentally fundamental conscious properties which are ubiquitous, but maybe there's no fundamental mind which harbors them. Um, uh, maybe you're just asking about whether or not there's a fundamental mind. Even if there is, you know, maybe it's just a kind of it doesn't have further properties like free will or goodness or anything like that. Maybe it's more so just like, um, you know, just this more it kind of impersonal, impersonally conceived consciousness uh, that's out there um, along the lines of how some might view Brahman, in fact. Um, now, again, I recognize that there are personalist strands of Hinduism uh, and then there are impersonalist strands. And I'm talking about the impersonalist strands, people. Uh, uh, I've, I've been berated on that enough to, uh, to emphasize that three billion times. Okay, so yeah, I do think it would provide a lot of evidence for theism because theism predicts that wonderfully and there are tons of hypotheses that don't predict that wonderfully and there are only a few that do. But among those few, I still think that that would underdetermine under which of those is correct. Well, I win because idealism is true. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm, I was, uh, it's interesting what you said there. I do. That's that's kind of been my 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 whole thing. Like, because I have people that will message me and go like, you know, can you be a, a, like an atheist and idealist? And I'm like, I, there are. I mean, there definitely are. I just I, to me logically, it just doesn't seem to follow. I think you know, if idealism is true, it does sort of lead to the necessary foundation being some sort of being. I mean, it could be Brahman, like you said, but I still think, you know, that's still, that still seems like a theistic account for me. And I think just in terms of like simplicity, if consciousness is fundamental, we would expect the foundation to be conscious, but we can move on because that's, that's really not what I wanted to pick your brain about. I'm more interested in a lot of this, this stuff on limits and um, brute facts of the nature. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe someday we have a talk on idealism itself. Cause I'm just, that that's that, I know that's not your area. That's really what interests me, and I, I love arguing mm -hmm. for that. But I just think there's just you know a lot there. But you know we could definitely move yeah. On and I mean I, stuff, I can I can just briefly say that I you know I I think people don't give idealism enough credit. Um, to be honest, uh, like it, I like monistic views of reality um, because they have that kind of simplicity. Um, and while I don't like bundle theory, you know, you might, you could probably try to get up uh, and I, well, you could probably try to get up an idealist view, which doesn't have bundle theory. So I just wanted to say, yeah, uh, you, can. That, you know, idealism, idealism doesn't get enough credit from uh, enough people. So I'll just say that as positive words for it. Well, the good news is we're growing. Uh, I, I'm happy about that. Uh, there's a, if anyone wants to know more, there's a great book called Idealism, New Essays in Metaphysics. I love the book. Um, every chapter has a different didn't, author and I love books like that. Yeah. Didn't Tyron Goldschmidt uh, contribute to that? I think oh, I think, yeah, that, I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I know Trent Doherty does, um, but yeah. Yeah, I used the book a lot. Uh, there was one chapter who, then the, there's a, a female philosopher. Who, um, fortunately, her name is escaping me and I feel really bad right now, but I really, I really enjoyed her chapter. Nice. Yeah. Well, I got, I feel bad. I need to look that up uh, because I, I want to <laughs> give her credit. Um, new essays in metaphysics but um while i'm looking that up i do want to i do want to talk more about the limit thing because I, I think you brought up some interesting points for sure um before we get to the bare facts of it though could i pick your brain on the whole trinitarian issue because i just i have just been thinking about this a little bit and i wanted to pick your brain on that yeah absolutely Cool. Um, it's Susan Schneider is who I'm thinking of, uh, who oh, wrote nice. the 17th chapter of the book. Yeah, really good chapter. Uh, so the whole Trinitarianism thing I think is interesting. Um, so I Joe, maybe before, I'm building. Hey, I'm, hey, hey Mike, before yeah, you go I'm, to the Trinitarian thing, it looked like your screen froze up. Um, oh yeah, Do, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear can you. you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. I have no idea what's going on in the screen thing. Let me try to figure that out uh, while I talk here. Um, it still says the the FaceTime thing, and I have this. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, you can go ahead and continue. It's, it's, yeah. You am I back? Am oh, I? All right, there I go. Yeah, you're back now. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, wonders of technology. Okay, so uh, the whole trinitarian thing is a limit thing. I think is a good approach. Um, I may, I would probably try to build off Swinburne a little bit here, and um, I was thinking about this the other day and about the whole limit thing. First of all, I think when we're talking about you know the being being unlimited, I think we're, we're talking about him in terms of properties, uh, not so much you know. And I don't think the persons are properties of God, uh, but I think maybe uh, you can make a case. Uh, so Swinburne, for example, talks about you know it's, it's having three persons is the uh, the uh, the essential amount you need to have a community of love. Two is just 
love between two persons, but having three sort of creates a community and that creates a perfect, a perfect understanding of love. Uh, I was thinking about that in, uh, in terms of Swinburne, but maybe thinking more about an experience uh, in a way. So, you know, like um, oftentimes we don't have full knowledge about, about ourselves uh, uh, from our own perspective. Sometimes we need an outside perspective to sort of join in uh, and sort of give us more insight about who we are as a person and having two persons helps that. However, sometimes couples who are really know each other quite well uh, sometimes need to th seek even a third person. They'll go to couples counseling and get therapy. So really, uh, you know, two people also need that third perspective outside to truly fully understand themselves. So maybe one could argue, and I, I, I have never, you know, spoken about this to anybody, so I don't even know if this is heretical, <laughs> so I'll just say that, or if I'm wrong or if I'm making some sort of error here, but maybe the Trinity is sort of like uh, a necessary aspect and can be explained by the fact that maybe it's the perfect way for God to fully understand himself in terms of experience and knowledge. It being able to experience himself from different persons, and three is the max that is needed to fully understand and be a complete, perfect being. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that sounds interesting? Do you think I'm making some errors there? Because I've not really spoken about that with anybody, so here goes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting, uh, and I think it's innovative. Um, I mean, there are, I think, a few ways to go. So one, just one th briefly at the beginning, you said, you know, like the unlimited thing applies to properties and the persons are properties. But, you know, we could just talk about the property of like being Trinitarian or, you know, existing in three mm. persons, you know, like that sort of property is indeed going to be uh, a kind of limited property in the sense of it's not four, it's not five, etc. So um, and then as to your positive proposal itself. So I guess I have one thing to say about the proposal itself and then two things to say about um, how it relates to the argument from limits. Um, so the first thing to say about the proposal itself is that um, like that kind of outside perspective needed in order to have a kind of full understanding, I can see that in the case of finite persons who aren't omniscient, but like <laughs> precisely because we're, we're not omni-understanding, we don't have perfection, but we're not talking about finite persons who need some kind of help from, you know, that kind of other perspective that uh, needs to help them to grow an understanding or something. They are already omniscient, essentially, by nature, etc. So I don't really see how that could work with an omniscient, infinite uh, personal being. I could definitely see how it works with us. Like, yeah, I need, uh, I might, um, in some sense, maybe not, need is not the word, but um, a couple brings out things in one another, brings out depths and layers of understanding, which is not present in one. And the same thing would be true if they go to like a counselor or a third person or something. But uh, yeah, that just applies to finite things because of our limitations and so on. That doesn't seem to me to apply to uh, an infinite being. So I guess I'll turn it over to you for that. And then um, I have two more things to say about how this relates to the argument from limits, but I will pause mm -hmm. those so we can camp out on the point that I just made. Yeah, I would like to hear that. Uh, so I think this is why I, I, I didn't I didn't uh, um, explain it in terms of knowledge, but more in terms of experience. Uh, not so not so I would define omniscience as knowing all true propositions. Uh, but I mean, like I don't think we need to explain omniscience and like you know God does not need to know what it is to be like Joe and to to sort of like so like you know some people try to say God cannot be omniscient uh, because he cannot actually experience being me without also being God. Uh, this is something I've heard on the internet. I don't know if you've heard it, but I've heard Layman make this argument. Uh, but yeah. so, so, you know, omniscience is just knowing all true propositions. So maybe it's more about God having an extrinsic understanding of his own nature and through experience, experiencing him, himself through other persons, captures that more perfection of what it is to truly know oneself is sort of what I was getting at. So that's more what I was getting at. That's why I didn't really try to encapsulate in terms of knowledge but more in terms of experience perhaps but again this is the first this is the first i've only just been thinking about it as of recently so i don't know how how strong that is yeah i mean i still think like uh i mean how could he like if, if he's truly unlimited and he's truly omniscient i don't see the need for there being other persons in order to him to fully even experientially understand himself like why is he so deficient that he needs <laughs> that he needs like additional persons inside of him in order to do well, that like is a perfect well, divine I mean, nature like, not enough well uh, let me just interrupt you sorry uh but like i mean like it's not so much that he the, he makes the other the persons to do that it's just it's just it's just a, it's it's a manifestation of who his he essentially is because we would not say the persons are like he makes other persons to experience himself. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's just a manifestation of you know like you know like Swinburne tries to say the Trinity is a manifestation of perfect love. 
So like maybe this is just a manifestation of what it means to truly know oneself in that sense. And you have to be multiple persons, I guess, you know, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, I'm still not seeing why you have to be multiple persons then. But like, if you're truly like, <laughs> what is so deficient about perfection that there like needs to be multiple persons in order for it to be fully self-understanding? Like, is like perfection not sufficient in itself? Is being omniscient not sufficient in and of itself for fully knowing yourself, even in an experiential manner? That seems to me to be implausible. But uh, I mean, maybe people have diverging intuitions there. I mean, I guess another point is like, well, if he needs. If in some sense, in order to be fully experientially understanding himself, there need to be a multiplicity of persons, well, uh, he'll understand himself even more if there are four. He'll understand himself even more if there are five and eight more if, even, if there are six and so on. So then soon enough, we've got a multiplication of persons ad nauseum. Um, and so, I mean, you know, ultimately, we're just going to say, okay, well, maybe there's some finite number and so on. And then we're getting into these arbitrary limits that you're trying to, trying to avoid in the first place. Like, oh, maybe love for some reason just has to end in three or maybe, uh, you know, perfect understanding just has to end in three. Again, we're getting into these kinds of like adding these auxiliary hypotheses, these brute facts, these mm -hmm. adding uh, arbitrary limits and so on. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, I think it's just maybe just a manifestation of what is perfection. It's not like he needs to make the person's, you know, like the father doesn't need to make the son to get this. It's just a manifestation of who he is. And I think, I think you bring up the whole three, why not four, why not five? It's a good question. I think maybe taking a Swinburne approach is just like, this is, this cap, this is all that is necessary to capture, you know, who he is, I guess. So but doing four would just be an unnecessary addition, I guess, perhaps, you know, I guess that's the way I would take, but I mean, we, we're probably just going to be tomato, tomato on that. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't three then be an unnecessary dish? I mean, you could have two people understanding themselves experientially. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, okay, let's just move on to the, the next two points that I wanted to make uh, regarding how this relates to the uh, the argument from limits, right? So the first thing... I really thing like how I you talk to... with your hands. It's amazing. It's yes, yes very exactly. Uh, soon enough, I'll bring up my feet, um, and then it'll be four, four things. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess that... Um, like the kind of two worries that I spelled out in my quote unquote opening statement uh, would be applying here. So one of them is like, okay, well, like once you say that, okay, yeah, God is limited in this way, that there are just, there are more fundamental facts that explain why he has these non-fundamental limits. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're appealing to perfect understanding, experiential understanding, uh, but like, so, so you're appealing to more fundamental facts about this thing to explain its non-fundamental limits. But it's like, once you do that, um, we still have the worries about, like, we still have brute facts here, we still have auxiliary hypotheses added, we've lowered its uh, simplicity, mm -hmm. we've increased complexity. Um, but also, like, the naturalists can then do the same thing, right? So we don't get to, um, just because we have an unlimited foundation, we don't get to a perfect foundation. Because it could be, have boatloads of limits, but those are just explained in terms of more fundamental non-limits or unlimited aspects of it. Perhaps they're just purely qualitative. So like it could be limited in power, limited in knowledge, maybe it doesn't even have any knowledge, so it's not really limited in that respect, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, those limits are just more fundamentally explained by more fundamental features of it. So it's like there's a kind of parody there. It's like if the theist can do that, then the naturalists can help themselves to it as well. Uh, and then I guess the second point was just that um, once you say that there's this more fundamental explanation that explains um, the multiplicity of persons, I do wonder still about their being God. Like, they seem to then be non-fundamental, the, the divine persons, uh, because there's this more fundamental feature of God, which is explaining why they're there, why there are the three of them. Um, it's like either God's love or maybe God's uh, perfect understanding. And so then they seem to be non-fundamental, but surely anything that's divine really anything that is god would have to be fundamental so i guess those are some worries that i have yeah i mean i'm not going to deny uh there are there are clearly brute facts on on theism and of course the, the, i'm not saying the the, the non-theists can can not appeal to brute facts to explain you know the necessary foundation that would not be god uh i it's about for me it, following you know uh, uh what's that guy's name who i'm thinking of um right ryan byerly who I'm thinking of, but um, it's about like um, reduced reduction. So I mean, yeah, you could make a case. There's a limitation here, limitation here. Uh, there's a brute fact here. I, I think the point the theist is trying to make is that we're we're trying to reduce as much well ma maintain as much as simplicity. Really, a better word would be parsimony, because you know if we're mm -hmm. gonna go with the simplest explanation, we all, we all should just agree with the Greek philosopher Thales that everything is water, because that's the simplest. Everything is just water. I can explain everything by saying it's water. Boom, I win. It's the simplest. But we, we would acknowledge, you know, like that doesn't that doesn't explain everything. It it just it just is it's simple, but it doesn't it doesn't have explanatory scope or power. 
So we want, you know, we want a worldview that is explanatory scope, explanatory power, plausibility, and is the least ad hoc. So simplicity is important, but it's not the only thing, if, if, especially if we're going to sacrifice explanatory power and scope, which I think is more important. So I think the theist would respond going, yeah, of course, you know, there's going to be complexity in there. There's going to be brute facts in there when we're talking about God as a necessary foundation. But I think the argument would be like, in return, it's like, well, the naturalist is going to have to make more. Uh, the naturalist is asked to posit more brute facts um, in terms of like why it's ne necessary, why it um, is able to bring about a universe, why it's able to bring about conscious beings and overcome the infamous hard problem of consciousness that also, you know, experience value and why, you know, these types of things. Uh, it just seems like theism has more explanatory scope in terms of that with power because it ex can explain it r with God's ontology sort of going from there. But I, I just want to be clear, I'm not denying there's definitely going to be brute facts on, on theism. In my opening thing, I just said we want to reduce the number. And I think the argument that Swinburne puts forward is this is going to reduce the most amount of bruteness, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a good clarification. It's just for me, I don't, I struggle to see once, you know, once, once we flesh this out, I struggle to see how it has in fact succeeded in reducing it in relation to the relevant competitor hypotheses. Like, it does, like, I don't know which one has more uh, bruteness in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one, because I've, we've just been uh, peeling away multiple aspects in which theism has various either auxiliary hypotheses or uh, brute givens, um, brute facts, etc. And for me, it's just, I don't know. It's just not clear. I don't know which one has more brute facts. It's just not a clear <laughs> assessment uh, at, at the end of the See, day. Um, this this yeah, is why uh, this is why I love talking with Joe, because he's just so freaking honest. And it's, it's, it's annoying, because <laughs> I want to, like, I want to be like, no, you were wrong, but I'm like, God, he like, makes me like him so much. Dang it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just one point that I would say. And then the second point is like, I do wonder whether or not theism does have explanatory advantages in those other areas. So maybe we could just, so l let's pick, let's pick one. Um, let's pick one that's fun. The hard problem of consciousness. Does theism have an advantage mm. there? Um, so <laughs> I, let me, let me clarify. I, I don't on, think theism yeah, yeah. has an advantage there. I would say I theistic idealism has an advantage. Okay. Cause okay. it just, okay. No. Okay. So it depends on the relative, uh, relevant hy competitor hypothesis. You said naturalism earlier. So, uh, well, naturalism itself is a little bit of a, uh, weasel word. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really trying to just keep physical for the audience because I got, well, physicalism is, um, the difference between physicalism and like naturalism is, is you, you, like for example um chain uh david chalmers is a naturalist but not a uh, physicalist i would say so naturalism yeah. would just be like everything sort of reduces to like you know something natural i guess i'm trying to keep things simple for the audience because i got yeah. so many comments saying oh this will go over my head so i'm trying really hard to make sure the audience i can keep the audience and so i apologize if yeah if i'm oversimplifying something and there's a philosopher going well actually because that that'll always happen <laughs> so i apologize if yeah. i'm simplifying things too much but yeah. physicalism is generally the idea so materialism is the idea everything reduces to particles uh sean carroll advocates for something like that uh physicalism is the idea everything reduces to something physical it may not be particles it could be quantum fields it could be some underlying undetectable physical substance so i th i think more non-theistic philosophers would be physicalists than materialists some might be naturalists some might be not i mean of course there's a whole mixed bag in there yeah yeah okay so some sort of naturalistic hypothesis uh, is the relevant competitor. So my question is, does theism better explain it? Okay, so, so naturalism, we do have this mysterious, uh, well, arguably, okay, this is controversial, but arguably there's some sort of mysterious gap between the third person, uh, purely publicly accessible, uh, like um, third personal properties, like shape and velocity and mass and uh, spin and charge. There seems to be some sort of gap there between Mm -hmm. those sorts of properties, the third person publicly accessible properties, and the first person qualitative subjective experience, like the taste of chocolate, the smell of freshly baked cookies from grandma on Christmas, etc. Okay, there's some sort of gap there. And it's hard to see how you bridge that gap. You know, you, it just seems like, you know, particles uh, in some sort of sufficient arrangement, and some sort of sufficiently functionally complex way, they give rise to it. Okay, that's kind of it seems mm -hmm. like a brute fact. Um, it's just primitive that you know this sort of c fibers firing in this sort of way functioning with this way and in inputs and outputs that has has the qualitative feeling associated with it some manner and maybe it's identical with it but um maybe it functionally realizes it maybe it causes it maybe it grounds it but whatever there's some sort of seemingly brute way in which these are associated uh 
Yeah, so there seems to be that explanatory gap there. But what I wonder is, isn't there a kind of corresponding gap on theistic idealism? Like, okay, I grant that you have a consciousness at the foundation and a mind at the foundation. Um, you're going to have to, in order to be able to, well, l l let me set that aside. There, I grant that you have consciousness at the foundation, but it's like, it seems to me that you still have this kind of primitive uh, relationship between this fundamental consciousness and its states and then our itty-bitty consciousnesses and their states, right? So it's like, how do you get from, uh, just, just as we can ask, how do you get from this purely third personal dust to like this uh, magic consciousness? How do you get from that to that? There seems to be a kind of construction problem. How do you get from this kind of um, subject of experience at the foundation, a god, to itty-bitty subjects of experience, right? Like, <laughs> in my mind, I'm not able to make itty bitty subjects of experience. Like I can imagine someone like Hermione or Harry Potter or even you. But when I'm imagining that, the things in my mind are not themselves conscious beings, right? They're not. They don't have. They're, they're not subjects of experience. Uh, so this seems to be a wholly mysterious capacity. Like somehow you go from this <laughs> uh, large conscious subject to getting itty bitty conscious subjects, and you seem to just ha like it just does. It's just kind of primitive, and you don't have don't seem to have a further illuminating explanation for that. Uh, so y you also seem to have this kind of problem of consciousness, just as a naturalist it ha faces difficulty going from the third personal stuff to this kind of first personal subject. You seem to have a difficulty going from the large first personal subject to the itty bitty first personal subjects. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, I think a great point um, uh, on that. Uh, a couple things I would say about there uh, that uh, for one, I think it's not nearly as hard for the it's not nearly as hard for the theist than it would be for the naturalist because you're talking about something that's uh, entirely different, going from something that's that's it's explained in terms of quantitative aspects to something that's qualitative aspects. Uh, you're going from something that is you know entirely uh, explained in terms of like spin charge, like you said, and then somehow you get something that's entirely ontologically different which would be like taste, qualia. So we're talking about quite an existential or quite a quite a gap in terms of uh, difference in terms of qualities. Whereas on theism, you're, you're still talking about the same qualitative aspects. So it's still consciousness coming from consciousness. It's not, you know, it's like, it's, it's easy to explain, you know, like, you know, how we can take matter and turn it into other matter because, you know, it's still matter. Uh, uh, with consciousness, you still consciousness coming from consciousness in that sense. So it's still going to be consciousness being explained in terms of its own ontology, not in terms of some entirely different ontology, which would be a physical ontology. So it seems like there is quite that big gap there. It's it's the same issue I'd say with a substance dualist in some ways, and that they got to explain how, you know, a mind is able to create an entirely different substance apart from itself that is also somehow contingent upon uh, the mind of God, but also not because it's also a qualitatively different substance. Uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I sort of abandoned substance dualism was these philosophical conundrums with, you know, the, um, the interaction problem and uh, different issues around that. Uh, so that would be the first thing I'd say. Another thing I could yeah. say about it is oh, appealing yeah. to the uh, the philosopher Bernardo Castrip, uh, who sort of talks about this a little bit. Uh, and he sort of talks about it like maybe it's this uh, concept of like um, uh, a healthy version of disassociative identity disorder. So, you know, you can think of like uh, someone who has this is also called, also called multiple personality disorder, multiple personality disorder. Um, you know, you have one conscious agent that switches between different alters. Uh, so what he tries to argue, and I think it's an interesting approach, is that maybe, you know, there's this greater consciousness and we are all just sort of disconnected from that consciousness, experiencing our own interesting personality we're developing. Uh, and I, I lately I've been thinking there might be some support for that in the scriptures as well. That, that could also be an interesting approach as well. Uh, this sort of idea that there's maybe this some sort of healthy version of multiple personality disorder. Um, I'm hesitant to use that term because I know that's not, it's hard to, talk about an actual mental disorder as it as if healthy but just trying to get it sort of like as a comparison here like you have this consciousness and you have these disassociative identities that are experiencing their own uh reality building their own personalities and then we eventually it's our our uh, it's um it's our calling in christian theology to reunite with god in some sense now of course there is some difficulties there i would say on my view and explaining on how that process would go or you know like the the how uh but i mean i think in terms of ontology it's just a simpler explanation because we're not appealing to entirely different ontologies. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like the way you say uh, that, like, okay, okay actually... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I could, I could sort of see... The, I want to say, firstly, that I can sort of see what you're going for there. So, like, I, I can kind of see that. It's not, it's not 
super implausible. But for me, like, I could still point to this. It, you have an entirely ontologically different thing. You've got this supernatural, ginormous, uh, ginormous in the sense of, you know, metaphorical, but you've got this supernatural, unlimited mind, which is so vastly different from ours. I mean, um, our ways are not God's ways. And, and, you know, that is somehow trying to explain these limited, contingent, finite, non-supernatural minds. These are entirely ontologically different. Like, if I'm putting myself in the mind of the physicalist, you know, they're probably going to say, like, <laughs> I don't know what the mind of God is like, and how, how, like, why would that be anything like our itty bitty consciousnesses? So, I mean, you seem to have also an entirely different ontological category giving rise to these itty bitty consciousnesses. Now, of course, they're both still conscious, but it's like, are they conscious in different ways, in different modes, in different manners? I'm not sure. Uh, it does the fact that one of them is unlimited and super duper powerful, does that change anything? I don't know. So, it's like, I don't know, like, where is the explanatory? Like, it's difficult to see because both of, both of these cases involve huge ontological rifts between the relevant explanandum and the relevant explanands. In the one case, yes, there's a big riff, it seems, between third personal properties and first personal properties, um, whereas at least an explanatory riff. Um, and then on the other hand, there still seems to be like a big riff between a supernatural, like ginormous, unlimited mind which is God's mind, whose God's ways are not our ways, and then our minds, which are limited and contingent and not beyond, you know, not supernatural, etc. So that's one way. And then as for the dissociative identity one, I guess my worry there is like, I wonder, I worry whether or not this is a mere descriptive account of, um, of like God's doing this as opposed to an explanatory account. Like, you're just kind of saying that like, yeah, God kind of in some way dissociates and it gives rise to the itty bitty consciousness, but it's like, Okay, but you've kind of just described that God does this and given it a label, dissociation. But it's like, where is the explanatory payoff? I don't really see it. I, I haven't. I guess the better way to put this is that I haven't been illuminated here. I have not been. I have not had a gain in understanding when you've given me that explanation. It seems to be merely a kind of descriptive, um, merely descriptive in import. Now, um, before I turn it back over to you guys, I'm at six percent battery. So if you could, um, you know party for the audience <laughs> while I go up and get my uh, charger. It'll take me one minute, so just 60 seconds. Uh, yeah, you so got yeah. it. Uh, you got it. Okay, I'll be yeah. back in I'll be back in a minute. All right, I'll uh, I'll do some do announcements guys, here. Uh, real, quick, uh, real quick, Marlon, should we go to, when do you want to go to questions? Uh, we're going to go to I, questions I now. Anyway. We only have two questions. So okay. that should be uh, <laughs> should be plenty of time, I guess, for the last fifteen minutes of the show uh, to get those two questions in. And it looks like those two questions are from the same person. So uh, yeah, if you guys didn't get the, I said it, uh, I believe at the beginning of the show that we was gonna answer some questions. So uh, if you guys want to get a question or two in now, uh, we'll be jumping to that portion of the show. Once Joe gets back, I was just trying to wait for a stopping point here, and I think Joe's ba Joe's battery on his cell phone said stop. So we're going to uh, <laughs> jump into the uh, a little bit of Q and A here. So if you guys have a question, uh, you guys feel free to pop those questions in. But in the meantime, we do have some questions here, uh, and you'll see a pop up at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, this is come from Reverend RV. Thank you for the question. Our existence is conge contingent on molecular bonding. If a contingency can be validated, it's true. Our existence is contingent upon it. If the existence of God can be validated, are we contingent on him? Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, I, I okay. be... Yeah, go ahead. You can take it. I'll, I'll go after you. <laughs> so insofar, uh, well, I'm not going to say that. Um, I, so if the existence of God can be validated, so I take that as saying that if if God's existence has been shown, or you know if God exists, um, does it follow from that that we're thereby contingent on Him? That's a really good question. Uh, whether or not on theism you could have beings that are independent of God. So you have like Platonists, theistic Platonists. Some people think that there are these abstract objects that are exist independently of God and are not in some sense dependent on Him. Um, and so they think that's compatible with God's existence. Now, it's an interesting question. Is it compatible for there to be like concrete beings like you and me and tables and chairs that are independent of God's existence? Like, is that at least compatible with there being a God? Um, it's a good question. I, if I were a theist, I would say no. I would, I would say that um, God, because he's perfect, has every perfection essentially. And it seems to me intuitively to be a perfection. 
to be that on which everything else depends if there are other things. That seems to me to be a perfection. Uh, you just seem to be greater if everything else has to receive its existence from you in order for that thing to exist. Uh, and so I would say that no, that's actually not compatible with God's existence. Um, but it's an interesting question because not everyone would share that intuition. Yeah, right. I, I would probably agree with Joe that for sure. Um, I, 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 as as someone who qualifies as a, a weak panentheist, um, I, I, I don't think it's possible for something to exist apart from God or not contingent upon Him. All right, uh, we have we have another question here, and this is from Sakal Lander. What's up, Kyle? How you doing, buddy? I uh, got to get you back on the show, buddy. All right, we have a question. What does Joe think about the intrinsic nature argument for panpsychism? Panpsychism? Idealism. I think I pronounced uh, that right. Uh, uh, Panpsychism. Dang, okay. I've totally destroyed that. (laughs) Panpsychism. I totally destroyed that, but it's all good. So, you guys, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Can Michael tell me what the argument is? (laughs) <laughs> oh, so what does Joe think about the intrinsic nature argument uh, for panpsychism idealism? I, I'm actually at a I loss. Mean, listen, I'm trying to remember what that is. I'm trying. I I'm think, trying to apologize, Kyle. I think See, Kyle, what he's saying know. is that it's the intrinsic nature or character of matter to be conscious, and if that's the case, um, then you have idealism or panpsychism. Now, like, is that? Well, really see, I'm not a panpsychist, I mean, so I wonder if he's trying to make. Yeah, I'm not. I'm a panpsychist. So I just wonder if he's trying to. I'm. I don't know. It's. See, I would even like think the nature in, of what. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, listen. I think this is what he has in mind. I think what he has in mind is Philip Goff's work, and um, Philip Goff basically says that what does science reveal? Science reveals to us the third person, purely third, purely third personal properties. But not only that, but the purely relational properties of the third person realm. Like this causes that thing, or this has certain charge, and that's just like a dispositional property under certain circumstances to give rise to certain outcomes. Etc. Same with all the other physical properties. So, like, those are all purely relational. And if that's the case, well, then you can't just have, like, well, one one way to go is that you can't have relations all the way down. You, there would have to be something with the intrinsic character there which stand in the relations. Now, ontic structural relationship, relation, ugh, ontic structural, structural relationalists would deny that. Um, but, you know, you might say that. And so then we have these things with uh, the intrinsic character of nature. And then Philip Goff goes on to say that it's simpler to have that to have that intrinsic nature or character be continuous with the only intrinsic nature or character that we know to exist, which is our conscious experience, because that has a kind of intrinsic character or nature. And he says that it'd be simpler to have that be continuous with the intrinsic nature or character of matter in the external world than it would be to posit a, an entirely different kind of intrinsic nature or character. I think that's what he has in mind. Um, Philip Goff's I kind mean, of master I, argument. I've always understood it as like, it's like, you know, if consciousness wasn't fundamental, um, it have to be determined by like intrinsic properties of matter, and there just isn't any intrinsic properties of matter. I hope I'm getting it right because I, I worry that I'm I, I miss getting it. But it's like, if consciousness is not fundamental, it's determined by uh, intrinsic properties of matter. Uh, but there's nothing in the intrinsic properties of matter that would suggest consciousness could come out of it or like be there. So that's a problem for it. And I hope I'm getting the right argument. But that's the way I kind of remember it. So it depends on what argument he's referring to. Uh, we could. Probably, I mean, <laughs> to answer this, we'd need to know what, what precise argument he's talking about. Um, All right. So unfortunately, I mean, it just depends on what argument that he's talking about. I think that's my answer. It, just, it depends on what argument you're talking about, Kyle. So, um, okay. My response. All right, here's another question here. Thank you for the super chat. Pablo, appreciate you. Will Joe ever consider becoming a Christian again? What do you say, Joe? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely if if uh if the evidence and reality leads me in that direction then absolutely 100 percent. uh so yeah all right mike jones you have anything mike i'll pray for you joe <laughs> thank you there it is that, i like i like saying that because i do mean it but it all for some reason it always sounds condescending i don't know why <laughs> All right, here's another super chat. Thank you, Arvin, for the super chat. Appreciate you. Joe, what can you say about S? Oh, man. Essay or Actus Ascente? Essay or Actus. Say it again. <laughs> Actus Ascente. Is that, am I saying that right? Oh, boy. Actus Ascende, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the perfection of all perfection. Can it be the answer to your question on how do we know God goodness is a perfection? Well, um, 
Okay, so there are a few things to say here. One thing is that, um, I mean, I think we could plausibly know that goodness is a perfection. I mean, granting this stuff about perfect being theology, granting moral realism, granting etc. Okay, you know, we're setting that stuff as a background. I do think granting all that stuff, we, we know what, that goodness is a perfection just because it intuitively, it's intuitively obvious. Um, so I think that's how we know it. And so my question wasn't really how, how we know that. It's more so whether or not that can have a more, a more fundamental illuminating explanation. And so whether or not that would count as an auxiliary hypothesis that would be have to add it, that would have to be added to the core hypothesis that there is this unlimited perfect thing uh, in order to infer, in order to flesh out the, the theistic hypothesis, in order to get the divine attributes. Um, I don't really see how this, the commenter or the questioner has offered an explanation of that. So I guess that that doesn't really um, address the, the, the worry. Um, and even if the questioner does offer an explanation here, I am skeptical of that underlying metaphysics. Um, I'm skeptical that there is such a thing as this essay as, or, or actus ascendi as Thomists conceive of it. I think it relies on theses like ontological pluralism, that there are multiple modes or ways of being or existence. And uh, I like ontological monism, uh, as do most contemporary metaphysicians and philosophers. I, I advise people to check out my video with Trenton Merricks. Um, I forget what it's called, but <laughs> the thumbnail is kind of whitish and it says existence on it with Dr. Trenton Merrick. So I advise people to uh, check that out if they want to learn about that debate further. All right. Mike, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, I think I think it, it's perfectly fine to appeal to intuitions on this. I think it's, in a lot of ways, it's, it's the job of the skeptic to sort of show that the intuitions could be wrong. Like, for example, you know, if we have an intuition that substance dualism is true, as a lot of people do in the West, you can show that that's just, you know, not a uh, global intuition that sort of uh, goes around the world. And so maybe that's not necessarily a good intuition to hold to. Um, I think that a lot of our intuitions with regards to the necessary foundation are perfectly okay, and it's okay to be skeptical of them, as Joe is. Uh, but I mean, like, at, at the same time, I would also say, like, you know, it's just, I'm not, I, I don't agree that we should just be skeptical for the sake of skeptical. I think we can also appeal to theism being the most likely explanation until we find a better option. So something I've said in, in debates I've had in the past, which is like, look, I'm going to offer an explanation of reality, which I say is theism. I'm not going to say it's proven. I'm going to say it is the best explanation so far. And I would, I'm going to believe it until someone can offer a better explanation. Uh, and so, sure, we can be skeptical of that, uh, but I just don't think the skeptic or the non-theist has offered a better explanation to this point. So, sure, there's there are there are brute facts that maybe we don't know fully how to explain there, but it still is the best explanation of reality itself. All right, all right, and we have another question here. Make sure all those out the way. It says, uh, "Can a Christian be a?" Monist, if he is an anthropological <laughs> phys physicalist, if they believe angels are made of different substance than humans, they are me in the in this case. Yeah, so I was just at a conference with uh, Chris Date, and he is a Christian physicalist, and he is a young Earth creationist. So he's like the only one in the world who is a young Earth creationist and a physicalist, which I found fascinating. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I, I was, wow, this is new. This is interesting. Uh, there are a couple, apparently, so that's interesting. Uh, I did not know they existed, but um, yeah. I think it is possible to be a Christian and be a physicalist. Uh, I don't, I think, actually, I think the question, the guy that asked this is also one as well. I remember talking with him about this. Uh, I think it's, I mean, I think obviously, you know, you're not saved if you are an idealist, a dualist, or a physicalist. That doesn't save you. That's not what salvation is about. So obviously you can. But, um, you know, uh, you could obviously be a Christian. I just think it's inconsistent with some of the things we find in the New Testament. And you have to use ad hoc reasoning to explain things like who appeared to Jesus at the transfiguration. Uh, who came up out of the grave when Saul in 1 Samuel uh, talked to the necromancer to call up the spirit of Samuel from the grave? Well, what's coming up? Well, it would be his spirit. It would not be a body rising out of a grave. That would be kind of weird. Uh, so I think you can be i just think it leads to a lot of ad hoc reasoning in terms of explaining away certain passages in the bible like transfiguration about jesus saying that um abraham isaac and jacob were still alive when god spoke to moses well not alive but still in existence somehow because god said i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob he did not say i was the god and that like they're somehow out of existence so jesus tells us they were still existing at some point there in some way like you know abraham isaac and jacob we're still existing and we're still the, and then gotten the, you know, the Lord of the Old Testament was still their God. 
Uh, and so he suggests they're still in some sense alive. Uh, but just not in a physical sense, I guess you could say. Uh, so I think it's just, you just get a little ad hoc explaining away certain passages. But yeah, I do think it's possible. All right. Any thoughts, Joe? I think it's in principle possible. Um, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to get in some really exotic metaphysics to, to make sense of the resurrection of uh, the dead. Uh, and the resurrection of the body and so on. Uh, you have to have something like gappy existence, so something can exist and then go out of existence and come back into existence. Um, you have to get away, you know, you have to avoid the cannibal problem, etc. So there are worries, but you know, you can do backflips and get around them. So yeah. All right. Uh, we have a couple more questions. I know you guys want to jet out, so a couple more questions, then we shut this thing down here. And this question. Well, that's not really a question. He's asking me a question here. And says, what contingency argument would you prefer? Kalam or Lebanese? Le What's that? Le How you pronounce that? How you pronounce Leibniz. that last name? Huh? Leibniz. Leibniz. Which Leibniz. one do you prefer? Leibniz. Leibniz. Yeah, Leibniz. I, I, um, Leibniz, look, yeah. You can go on. You can go first. I don't care. Uh, I prefer uh, uh, the Leibnizian uh, contingency argument, per, for sure. I'm not a, not a huge fan of the Kalam because I don't like arguing from causality. I prefer Leibniz. Um, I think he definitely. Um, I mean, I'm, more, I'm again, I'm an idealist, so I, I focus more when I argue for contingency. I'm more arguing for emergence, like the universe emerges from a mind. So I'm not. The Kalam is all about causality. Uh, so that gives me a question. Before I answer that, uh, I just want to ask you, Michael. Um, so you said with respect to like things that we would call physical objects, you have a kind of bundle theory about them. Do you also have like, um, like a constant conjunction view of causation or like how far does your human sympathies, how far do they extend? Probably not. I, you see that, that's something I'm still kind of agnostic on. I'm not, I've not studied a lot of causality to be honest. It's just not something that I've that really piqued my interest. So I have gone back and forth on different views on that. And I'm just not, I'm not sure where I am on there. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah. So as for the question, so, I mean, you know, we can kind of categorize how our arguments, how we like, but like in general, as philosophers categorize it, the Kalama would count as a cosmological argument, but it would not count as a contingency argument. So Mm -hmm. um, the Kalam is, is a cosmological argument in the sense of it focuses on some general feature of reality, like maybe the universe's beginning, and then it tries to argue for some kind of explanation or cause or ground of that, and then it tries to identify that with God. So that's what a cosmological argument is. Um, but a contingency argument would specifically focus on the fact that there is contingency and not the fact that the universe began or something like that. And then it would try to, in some manner, go from contingency by means of some explanatory principle to a necessary concrete thing. So that's generally how philosophers... Uh, carve up the conceptual terrain. Uh, now, which of those would I prefer? Yeah, definitely Leibniz's contingency argument. I am not a big fan of the Kalam. Uh, to those who are interested, I do highly recommend checking out um, the playlist on my channel. It is my Kalam cosmological argument playlist. I have maybe 35 different videos in there, videos that explain what the Kalam is, the different kinds of Kalams that you can run. Uh, I look at different paradoxes of infinity. I look at Hilbert's Hotel in extreme depth. I look at uh, Benedetti paradoxes, that is paradoxes involving Grim Reapers and deafening gongs, and, etc. Um, and I have on different scholars to talk about them, like Wes Morrison, Alex Malpass, Graham Oppie, etc. And I give lecture videos of my own. So for those who are curious about why I'm not, I'm not a fan of the Kalam, uh, they can check out that playlist. All right, all right. All right, and this will be the final question of the night right here. A super chat. Thank you, Pablo, for another super chat. Appreciate your support. IP, what's coming up on your channel? Praise God. What you got, Mike? N nothing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I got plenty of stuff coming up. So I'm going to finish my... I've been doing a lot of stuff on Old Testament. Uh, I'm going to finish a series on the documentary hypothesis. Uh, well, I'm not going to finish it. I'm, go I'm doing seven videos on the documentary hypothesis of the Old Test of the Pentateuch and the problems with it, uh, why uh, a lot of scholars are now rejecting it, and why uh, we could probably can't divide the Pentateuch up into these four different sources. Uh, so I'll finish, I'll do the first seven videos, and then over the next year I'll do some more on that because there's some other topics I want to get with regards to that. A lot there. I'm also going to be uh, doing a video on 2 Kings 3, verse 27 where it says that Mesha the king of Moab sacrificed his son and divine wrath came down upon Israel and they ran because a lot of skeptics say this is evidence that the god of Moab Chemosh 
defeated the God of Israel. And I'm going to argue that's not the case. I'll also do a video on Judges 119, was God defeated by iron chariots? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then I'm also then I'm going to start a series on eschatology, and I'm going to answer the question, was Jesus a failed apocalyptic prophet? Did he predict the end of the world was going to occur in the first century? And I'm going to say, no, uh, he did not. Uh, he uh, So I'll cover that in more detail and what my view is. I'm going to do some our case for post-millennialism. This is my eschatological view. And post-millennialism is the idea that the, the, the church's job to keep making the world better and better until we or he turned it into Eden, and then the second coming will occur sometime after that. Uh, so that's generally my view. Uh, well, in terms of eschatology, I don't think there's going to be some future tribulation or antichrist. I think it's just our job to make the world into another Eden, and that's just a long process because we are uh, fallible humans. Then I'll do some stuff on New Testament. I'm going to argue that the, the, the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies, argue for some evidence of them, and see where I go from there. I probably will, tour after that, return to the Old Testament and do stuff on the conquest. Well, it looks like you got a full slate, Mike. So I'm praying for you, brother. I sure do. To make sure you, uh, <laughs> sure do. you get all that out. And I'm going to make sure I'm going to be messaging you. Make sure you get that stuff out, man. No slacking, buddy. No slacking. Now, nah, good stuff, man. <laughs> oh, so, chief. I, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, you know, Marlon, if you want to help me get it done, you can go to my Patreon and you can donate and that will help me keep going. <laughs> I got you, dog. I got you. I got you. No, that's a great segue, though. I mean, the question was great because it did allow Mike to sort of lay out what he has coming. So, Joe, this is your opportunity. Go ahead and let people know where they can come check you out, man. What you got? Yeah, so uh, tomorrow I am uploading a video on the argument from limits. Uh, pretty timely. So anyone who listened to this discussion will enjoy my video tomorrow. Um, after that, I've got different video plans. These may take a while, so people don't uh, harp on me. Um, but I want to do a video on a user's guide to Bayes' theorem, basically just to help people understand what Bayes' theorem is, how to use it, how not to use it, um, and different ways to like visualize it and to make it intuitive. Um, so I want to do a, like a user's guide to Bayes' theorem video. I also want to do a user's guide to modal logic video. So basically telling people, hey, what is logic? What is modal logic? What are the different systems of modal logic? Why does it matter for philosophy? Um, I want to do that. Uh, I also am going to be doing, this will probably border, be bordering into 2023 now, a video on all symmetry breakers for the modal ontological argument. I am working on a special project that I can't talk about yet, but um, I'm working on a special project on uh, ontological arguments and specifically modal ontological arguments and specifically symmetry breakers for the modal ontological argument and so I uh, I'm basically going to be presenting stuff about that project and I'm very much looking forward to when that project is out but again can't really talk about that um, then I also want to get on Patrick Todd next year he's a philosopher um, he argues for well open theism yes but an open future view where all future contingent claims are false they're all false um, so I want to interview him about his recent book, Defending All Falsism. Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, maybe it's called something like, no, I forget what it's called. Um, man, I really should remember. But he has a recent like 2020 book or something, and it's a really good book, and I want to get him on to talk about it. So yeah, I'll have Patrick Todd on. Um, I also want to have next year, uh, early next year, Graham Oppie and Eric Steinhardt to talk about um, religious naturalism. So whether or not uh, there are viable religious practices that naturalists can participate in. Eric Steinhardt advocates for a kind of religious naturalistic paganism. Uh, so it'd be really interesting to have Graham, and Op Graham Oppie does not, so it'd be interesting to have them go back and forth about that. And then uh, another thing that I'll be doing in the new year is uh, I'll be doing a giveaway of my new book, which is coming out with Springer. Uh, is a monolithic research monograph. It's like 378 pages. <laughs> it is co-authored with uh, Daniel J. Linford, and it is called Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. Um, it is, is in philosophy of religion, it's in metaphysics, it's in philosophy of time. It's very fun. So yeah, people stay tuned. I'm a, hey, I'm gonna be busy too. Yo, you, you, you. <laughs> both you guys got a full slate, man. And I appreciate you guys, man, for jumping on here and giving us a rundown, man. I think a lot of this stuff, I took notes too. So I don't want you guys just thinking I was in the background, just 
twiddling my thumbs and then I took notes and I'm gonna dive into these notes and, and, and flow over to you guys page and sort of get a more in-depth understanding of what you guys are discussing because a lot of stuff really was like Ooh, you know so it's gonna require need me to sit down and really look at this stuff but uh, I thank you guys so much and I look forward to perhaps doing something like this another time you know uh, you guys may not be doing it together perhaps with somebody else but nonetheless you guys are great I appreciate you guys decorum and the way you guys got along through the discussion and the audience definitely appreciated so uh, you guys have any final words before I shut this thing down no that's great I was really happy to have this conversation Joe gave me a lot to think about things I really want to dwell on and uh, try to flesh out uh, more well thought out uh, responses to them so I really do appreciate that yeah and likewise with you I really enjoyed the conversation and I really enjoy these sorts of uh, I don't know if I want to say laid back, but you know, like non polemical conversations, I think they're very valuable and very fun. So, um, so yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. I have one more statement. One more uh, statement here. Another super chat it said, "Too much philosophy. Just look at the trees, bruh. Problem solved." Uh, <laughs> you can't. Trees are pagan, don't you know? All pine trees are pagan. <laughs> All right, guys. Good stuff, man. So, you guys are out of here, man. Thank you guys so much, man. I appreciate you. All right.